when Sir Walter Scott wanted a telescope, he knew the man to make it. This was James Veach, born in the same year as Scott, 1771, 250 years ago. Scott was an Edinburgh lawyer, like his father. But his grandparents farmed near Kelso, and he was sent to them at the age of two to recover from polio. The boarder's experience shaped him for life. There were folk tales from shepherds, stories of border reaving, and memories of the Jacobite rising for Bonnie Prince Charlie. He heard songs and ballads, all in the rich, warm voices of the people, voices that would eventually find expression in his novels. Those voices stayed with him when he returned to Edinburgh for schooling. Then came Edinburgh University and a law apprenticeship with his father. But his law career took him back to the borders as Sheriff Depute of Selkirkshire. He bought a farm on the River Tweed near Melrose and developed the house into the grand country home of Abbotsford. In Edinburgh, he had started writing narrative poems. Their success encouraged work on a novel set in the aftermath of the Jacobite Rising. Its title was from its hero, Waverley. Just after publication, he was invited to join the annual tour of inspection of the Northern Lighthouses. In Strumness, he heard the story of the pirate John Gow from an old woman who sold fair winds to sailors. That led to a later novel, which also features sisters of the Arctic explorer Dr John Ray. Lights in the sky sometimes appear in Scott's writing. Moonlight or faint stars, sometimes the northern lights, and fire in the night from beacons of war. James Veach, who made his telescope, was a good friend. The Veaches were farming folk near Jedburgh. James was apprenticed as a ploughwright and showed great skill. He calculated a design for an improved plough with lighter weight and greater pulling power, and he proved its success by winning a big ploughing match. In spare time he started making telescopes and clocks. He made reflectors in metal and lenses in glass and sometimes crystal, and his reputation spread. He tested his telescopes on a tall oak tree nearly a mile away. If a telescope could show the eyes of a bird in its topmost branches, then it was good enough for the stars. It was only when he was around 55 that he gave up the plough work and went full-time into making scientific instruments, including microscopes and barometers. His workshop was a great meeting place for people of all ages, including French prisoners from the Napoleonic Wars. One of them, captured at Trafalgar, made a telescope. Another painted a picture of Jedburgh in appreciation of much kindness. Earlier in his career, he helped the young son of the Jedburgh Grammar School rector. Every day after school, the boy would visit the workshop and stay late to look at the stars. He went to Edinburgh University, intending to be a minister, but the call of science was too strong and he changed career. He had studied light from distant stars with Veach's telescopes. Now he looked at its path through crystals and discovered the laws of polarisation. He invented the binocular camera and the kaleidoscope and was knighted as Sir David Brewster. He never forgot those early days and maintained a lifelong friendship. Someone else from Jedburgh who knew Veach well was the astronomer and mathematician and all-round scientist Mary Somerville. Her only telescope was made by him. She was born in the Jedburgh Manse, where her aunt was the minister's wife. In her childhood home at Burnt Island in Fife, she had to help her mother in house and garden. Her father was a naval officer who became a vice-admiral. At the village school she learned needlework, 
but she wanted to learn Latin like the boys, so taught herself from the books at home and was soon reading Roman authors. She carried on reading Greek, astronomy, geometry, algebra. Her first husband wasn't too keen, but he didn't live long and left an inheritance which gave her more freedom. She built up a library of books and studied everything, chemistry and microscopy, geography and electricity. Two Edinburgh University professors helped and encouraged her, and now she was solving difficult mathematical problems and studying the work of the great European mathematicians of the time. Sir Isaac Newton had led the way in applying mathematics to physics. He particularly used geometry, as did his successors. Among them was Colin Maclaurin, who died 275 years ago and taught the great Orkney mapmaker Murdoch Mackenzie. But on the continent there was a new approach. Newton's geometric diagrams were being replaced by algebraic expressions summarising a wealth of possibilities in a single group of symbols. Britain was slow to follow, and it was Mary Somerville who led the way through her translations from Europe. The sheer scale of her work is immense. She was one of the people who predicted that irregularities in the motion of the planet Uranus were due to a new planet later found and named Neptune. She wrote the first textbook in physical geography. Her book on the mathematics of planetary motion became a standard text at Cambridge. She married again, this time to a man who shared her love of science. His family were neighbours of Sir Walter Scott and she loved evenings with stories at Abbotsford. When she died in 1872, one newspaper described her as the Queen of Science. So, when we think of the wheeling orbit of the planets, we can remember that wonderfully sparkling mind that took forward the mathematics of their paths.
Sir David Brewster, the Jedburgh man who worked in the science of light, is buried in the grounds of Melrose Abbey. Someone else who may be buried there, though no one knows where, also played a part in the story of science. This man's name was Michael, and on travels abroad he was known as Michael the Scot, or simply Michael Scott. That led people to associate him with the Scott family of the borders, but again it's not sure. Michael appears in history in 1217, in Spain, in the city of Toledo. He translated a book that puts him at the heart of medieval scholarship. Scholars went to Toledo for the books of the ancient Greeks. The Romans had been less interested and Greek works had faded from Western view. But in Persia and Baghdad they were translated into Arabic with new commentaries and they reached the West through Moorish Spain. Michael translated a commentary on Aristotle by a great Muslim philosopher of the time. He went on to translate Aristotle's books on zoology. His reputation continued to grow. In 1224, the Pope asked the Archbishop of Canterbury to find a post for him. Michael, he said, flourishes among other men of learning with a singular gift of science. But it's in Sicily that we find him next, at the court of its king. There he translated further books and met the great mathematician Leonardo of Pisa, known as Fibonacci, who dedicated his main work to him. Mathematics could be delicate. One scholar called it dangerous Saracen magic. Michael was much involved in astrology and alchemy, and the Italian poet Dante, in his Divine Comedy, put him in the eighth circle of hell reserved for sorcerers. In Scottish border folk tales, he was a wizard who cleft the Eildon Hill in three. In 1805, Sir Walter Scott's first long narrative poem, The Lay of the Last Minstrel, became a bestseller. It tells of a man who opens Michael's grave and steals his book of magic. Dramatic events follow before the book gets back. There's a flash of lightning and glimpses of an arm or hand or waving gown. One man sees even more. At length, by fits, he darkly told, with broken hint and shuddering cold, that he had seen right certainly a shape with anise wrapped around, with a wrought Spanish baldric bound, like pilgrim from beyond the sea, and knew, but how it mattered not, it was the wizard Michael Scott. Sir Walter's own reputation has seen changes. He was remembered by the great monument in Princess Street in Edinburgh and the naming of Waverley Station. But the 20th century looked for novels of character, focusing on deep thoughts and actions of a hero or heroine. The critics could admire Scott's minor characters, drawn from the rich mix of the people he met in the borders and the city. But the heroes and heroines were dismissed as being rather average people of their time and a bit flat. But he got strong support from a surprising source. History is at the heart of Karl Marx's philosophy. For Marxist literary critics, historical novels must be about historical forces. A book's main characters should not change history. They should simply be people who are representative of the times they live in. Scott meets these criteria superbly. His heroes and heroines are, first and foremost, people of their time. They don't shape events, they are carried along by deeper historical currents. The doyen of the Marxist literary critics was the Hungarian scholar Georg Lukács. His great work on the historical novel was published in Moscow in 1937. It was the time of a terrible Stalinist purge, with executions, show trials and deportations to gulags. 
The book often refers to Marx and Lenin, with many mentions of novels about the struggles of the working classes under capitalism. But it extols, time and again, Sir Walter Scott. In the opening paragraph, Lukács says, Scott did something done by no one before him. He derived the individuality of his characters from the historical nature of the times they lived in. In the heart of Stalinist Russia, here is the highest praise for a pillar of the conservative establishment. History for Scott means, in a very primary and direct way, the fortunes of the people. His first concern is the life of the people in a given historical period. Only then does he embody a popular destiny in an historical figure and show how such events are connected with the problems of the present. This process is an organic one. He writes from the people, not for the people. He writes from their experiences, from their soul. Scott was much admired by a later writer who shared his love of the Scottish borders and of people. John Buchan was a conservative, but a friend of politicians on the left as well as on the right. As Governor-General of Canada, his friendship with President Roosevelt helped lay the foundations for the US to enter World War II. He loved the outdoors and was a keen climber. Like Scott, he wrote stories of the supernatural. One of them, called Space, came after reading ideas in philosophy and mathematics. It tells of a mathematician who starts to see forms appearing in empty space. The starting point is the physics of a field, an area of empty space with deeper forms within it that produce electric and magnetic and gravitational effects. On the centenary of Scott's death, John Buchan paid a tribute. Sir Walter, he said, makes the world more sunlit and also more solemn. He gives us something that few novelists can do, and not many poets. A great heritage of warmth and light. And that's something that might be said for all these lives linked by a love for the borders, and its vistas of land and sky. For James Veach, the telescope maker, and Sir David Brewster, who looked into the night sky with him. For Mary Somerville, probing the mathematics of the orbits of the planets. For John Buchan, walking the hills and reflecting on the nature of space. For Sir Walter Scott, enjoying the night sky in all its aspects. For the shadowy figure who preceded them, Michael Scott, we can only wonder about his thoughts as he looked up at glittering stars. The closing music by Eddie Maguire would fit them all, depicting the bright stars of the constellation Auriga. And we're now going over to join the musicians with an introduction by Ellen Thompson. So, our next piece is now by Scottish composer Eddie Maguire, who I'm told as a child was fascinated with stars and astronomy, just like us today. Now, his piece is called Auriga, which is another five-star constellation. Uh, now, in this piece, I'm told each uh, instrument represents the five stars of the constellation. So, the first trumpet is the bright star, which is Capella. It's hot and fiery and every now and then has a kind of hot flare, so you might hear that. The second trumpet is a fainter star, so therefore it's a bit more muted. The horn and the trombone take on two more stars, and the tuba is what's called a variable star, or a so-called variable star. It's orbited by a mysterious dark object that blocks its light whenever it moves in front of it. So here playing live is the Wallace Collection with Auriga by Eddie Maguire.
Thank you. 